Hi, I'm Aaron. And I'm Ian. Uh, here we are at the KCL Labs house mechanical garage. Literally every single part of this robot was validated and prototyped right here with these all these 3D printers. So uh, welcome to our space. Yeah, and here you can see the designs in front of you, our K-Bot full-size humanoid robot. And our design intent through this all has been robots for the masses, keeping things uh, accessible, affordable, um, keeping things simple, both for reliability, maintainability, and for simulation down the line, making it as easy as possible to get this up and walking for yourself. Mm -hmm. So this is the KBOT V0.1. We completed this last October. We wanted something out quickly to be able to validate our RL approach. Um, yeah. And then transitioning the same joint layout, you know, what we proved out functionally to our KBOT V1.0, a lot closer to what we'll be putting out to you all. Um, clearly, a lot of updates on the fit and finish, the aesthetics, and also the reliability, safety. Uh, the wiring harness has seen a lot of improvements, so we're excited to bring it out to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so should we take these robots apart and uh, get into the details? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, so let's start with the battery then. Yeah? yeah, the heart of it all. Here we have our 13 amp hour lithium ion battery pack. Uh, our first version had a nice solid handle with a ball detent locking mechanism on the side. We did see some initial issues with the ball detent not being super secure when the robot's running some of its more aggressive, you know, high energy policies as well. Uh, any sort of fall impact load cases, you're going to see this handle be the first point of contact and generally you want your uh, battery to be nice, safe, secure inside of the shell. So moving over to our new model. It's a completely flush on the back, so it's uh, um, completely flush with the entire torso. We, that's really important because if the robot falls, falls back, we don't want it to be hitting the handle and we also want it to be able to get up from a lying down position. Um, the chemistry inside of the batteries are completely the same, so they should support about four hours of continuous operation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what we're looking at in the future is iterating on this handle design once more, uh, get, making it a little bit more ergonomic, a little bit more sturdy, um, and just making sure this battery is never going to fall out. All right, let's continue with the head then. Yeah, so you can see on our V0.1, there's a distinct lack of head. We were packaging the control board in the center of the torso along with the rest of the electronics. What we realized is this isn't a great user feel in terms of serviceability and future upgrades. So on the new robot, we have it up here on top of the torso. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is really important to us because we wanted the users to be able to easily swap out their heads if they want to upgrade it down the line or if they want to customize for a different application. If you want to add on, uh, for example, a depth sensor, you can design your own 3D printer head and, and put it onto the pretty standard interface. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the future, we are looking at upgrading the CAN control board. We'll show you that in a minute, as well as improving the interface at the back of the neck for better user feel. Yeah, cool. Let's uh, take it apart. All right, so here we have the torso exposed to you all. Um, you can see the two main PCBs here. Mm -hmm. So this is the power board. Uh, it's in charge of distributing the 48 volts from the battery to each of the four limbs. Um, for both the can lines, as well as the power lines, are all daisy chain from one actuator to the next. So that's why we only have uh, four connections here. And as Aaron said, yeah, we have our CAN board here taking in all of the controls from all of the different actuators, daisy chain to each one. This is just a simple USB interface up to the head. So in the next revision, we're going to be combining these boards into a much more compact one, uh, into one PCB on the back of the uh, battery case. So it will be much more, uh, much neater. Mm -hmm. um, we're also going to be improving the e-stop. It will be integrated into the power board, uh, both a wireless as well as a wired solution. Um, so currently it's just a um, very simple e-stop using contactor off the shelf for our own purposes. All right, uh, let's move on to the limbs where the interesting stuff is, yeah? Yeah, definitely. All right, and here you can see us taking apart the left arm here. I uh, wanted to show off our general design intent of the clamshell design versus a lot of other competitors are going for more of a skeleton and cover. Um, here with the clamshell design, we're able to, on the one hand, 
actually increase the structural rigidity, support, and uh, robustness against any sort of impacts and falls by building the structure into all of our external facing components. As well, you can see the wire routing uh, and general you know, wiring harness is much easier to access with open areas, uh, direct lines to the motors. Mm -hmm. Another benefit of the clamshell design is that we have really nice built-in hard stops into the design. It was much, much harder to get reliable um, hard stops and limits uh, on the old design, so that's something we learned from that added on to here. Mm -hmm. And throughout the design iteration process, we've also been playing around with where light weighting can happen, where we're able to add extra rigidity and um, support and just optimize the mm -hmm mass distribution in general. All right, and as we're looking at the left arm, here we have the end effector. Uh, previously, we were basing it just on a simple, you know, proof of concept, claw type, rack and pinion, gear hand. But as we're thinking through, you know, a generalized humanoid robot, we really wanted to enable people to be putting it, their own custom end effectors for any sort of application you'd be throwing at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're going to be offering a much better version of the uh, parallel gripper using, instead of a rack and pinion, we're going to go with a four bar link, uh, like a linkage design that's going to be much smaller. Um, but there's still going to be the option to order hands. So we've been testing out different suppliers for the five finger hands. Uh, we are not yet making our own five finger hands because that's is quite, uh, yeah, quite labor intensive, but definitely something we're interested in and very interested in doing in the future. Yeah, down the line. Uh, currently, it's mounted using a off-the-shelf Micro Four Thirds camera mount just for giving it a nice user feel and some nice borrowed tolerances, borrowed uh, rigidity. You can see here, connect it all together. All right, so uh, as mentioned before, a lot of the joint limits are implemented with the clamshell design, uh, but some of them we had to do our, uh, a different solution. Yeah, yeah, so you can see in the um, elbow as well as some parts of the legs that it actually just ends up hard stopping on different extents of the external shell. But when you're looking at some of these more complicated joints, the two doff in the shoulder, the three doff in the hip, uh, we end up having to turn towards actual um, separate sort of tooth designs ending up hard stopping on different features. This allows us to really control where the motor is in its travel and make sure that the you know, joints are actually understood by the reinforcement learning model where they are in space. Yeah, and uh, one more cool thing I wanna show you guys. Um, so this is uh, an example of how we use the 3D printing to validate the designs. Um, wiring is one of the main things that is really tough to check in CAD. Um, so we 3D printed them out and um, check, make sure all the wiring is good. Um, we have the actuators installed in here. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So with the arm and the uh, side of the torso off, we can direct our attention to the lower half. Um, let's start with the hip. Yeah, so the hip is our major three degree of freedom joint here, always being activated with the leg. Um, you see historically a lot of humanoid developers go for, in terms of the actual actuator configuration, doing the adduction before the flexion joint, um, whereas we do the flexion here before the adduction. That does give you some benefits in terms of your cost of transport. Mm -hmm. um, less actual weight being moved with the common forward backward movement of the leg. However, you do incur a lot of sort of packaging and design trade-offs when you're doing that. Yeah, so we went for a flexion, abduction, rotation, um, hip configuration because we wanted the back of the robot to be flat for it to be able to uh, lay flat like this or to be able to sit in a chair. This is a very important for a human that's ready for consumers because every interaction with a humanoid is going to be starting with the robot in those positions. Uh, we don't want it to have to be on a gantry or something like that. Um, and uh, 
what has allowed us to do this is a lot of advancements in the actuator technology. Yeah, yeah, you can see here this uh, RSO4 uh, actuator at 120 newton meters. A lot of these quasi direct drive motors have both dropped in price and increased in performance recently. And that allows us to obviously package the torque we need here to be able to be still moving this leg um, under high load situations and just quickly in general. Mm -hmm. All right, so now that we have the side of the shin popped off, you can see actually the only uh, actuator that is offset from its drive axis here on the ankle. Um, choice here, partially for packaging, you can imagine trying to fit this down here by the foot, but even more so in terms of cost of transport, the sort of leg dynamics, moving the mass up in the leg reduces the amount of weight you're moving with each leg stroke. Yeah, so the linkage that we have designed here is a Palarga, meaning the uh, lengths here are equal to this one, and then the, also the angles. Um, correspondingly. Um, the, the, the reason we did this is because we wanted the robot to be really easy to simulate. Um, with this design, we're able to have the joint be directly at this ankle because the torque, trans torque output uh, at this motor is the same as it is uh, at this uh, joint over here. Yeah, easy to simulate. That's definitely been a major focus with all of the, the leg layout. You can also see here on the foot, uh, we went from an initial sort of just flat-footed design to a capsule design partially for the actual dynamics, but even more so because the capsule uh, sort of rounded edges play a lot nicer in simulation, being a lot more accurate in terms of uh, the simulated environments that we're doing in Mujoko. Yeah, that's right. As we've gone through all of our different designs showing you the insides of our components, I'm sure you can see a common issue has been dealing with all of the wiring, packaging, and routing, um, especially with these motors here that we have with the wiring coming out of the back and going radially outwards. Mm, that's right, yeah. Um, in some of the more expensive humanoids, you will see the, them using actuators with a hollow shaft, and that allows for the wires to be routed through that hollow shaft and the mechanical design to be a little bit more um, easier in terms of the wire routing. The reason we didn't go for that is because we're really focused on getting a human to be as accessible, affordable as possible. So we want to use actuaries that are off the shelf, already being mass produced and reliable for consumer use. So these actuators are already being used in industries other than robotics. It's very popular and uh, that's why the ch prices can come down. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And to mitigate some of the issues that you run into with these uh, radially wired motors where they're having to follow along the full range of travel of these joints, there's opportunities for them to strain, for them to pull, for them to fray. Uh, a lot of these joints, we've been running them through uh, either as far centrally or just through the actual rear bearing of our design. Uh, again, keeping it on the center axis and limiting that amount of travel that the wiring has to do. All right, so that was uh, most of the robots taking apart, got the limbs, the torso. Um, let's talk about the actuators a little bit because that's a really important part of the robot. Yeah, and you can see laid out in front of us are all four styles of actuator that we're using. Uh, the Robstride 03, 02, 04, and 00. Mm -hmm. um, let's go over a little bit about like what these actuators are. They're all um, pine tree uh, gearboxes and they are QDD actuators, quasi-direct drive. Um, they have very low gear ratios, all under 10 to 1. Um, and um, we'll go into a little bit of why that's important. But before that, the key elements uh, of the actuator. Yeah. So you're seeing actually within the actuator, the rotor and stator, um, just being the outer housing for the stator and then the rotor here in the center. Um, specifically with the QDDs, you see a high band gap diameter here. This actually gives you higher torque even for a lower um, gearbox ratio. Speaking of gearbox, you see towards the front we have the planetary gearbox single stage uh, within that 10 to 1 
or lower gearbox. And then out the back, you see the actual control scheme with the PCB and the dual encoder setup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the dual encoders are important to give uh, absolute positions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so QD actuators, they, they've been around for quite a bit. Um, they start with the MIT Cheetah. Um, the, having a, a low gear ratio is really important because uh, you can imagine the, as during the motion of walking, it's constantly changing direction. So a, a low gear ratio, a low reflected inertia, um, we don't have to spend as much energy changing the direction of the actuator, actually moving the gearboxes. Thanks for tuning in um, and listening to us. If you want to learn more, check out the docs. Um, everything is open source. Yeah, KBot just dropped pre-order link for the full uh, developer kit coming out later this year. Pre-order is available today. Check it out. Yeah, be part of the revolution. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.